We are so glad here at Anderson Seventh Avenue Church that you're here with us, both members and visitors and guests. We're glad to have you today, and we thank you for worshiping with us, and hopefully you will be back again. We are going to continue today with our series and the 28 Fundamental Beliefs We Believe, and we're on number nine, and we... I'll go ahead and read that to you, but first, let's ask the Lord's blessing and prayer as we study the Bible together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your mercy in our lives, and truly, Lord, when we look at the gospel message, we see how merciful you are. Lord, as we open the scriptures today, we want to hear your words. We want to hear your voice So, Father, I ask that you would put your words in my mouth, and the Lord, that you will bless the hearts and the minds of those who are here to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, fundamental belief number nine is the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It reads, in Christ's life of perfect obedience to God's will... His suffering, death, and resurrection, God provided the only means of atonement for human sin. So that those who by faith accept this atonement may have eternal life. And the whole creation may better understand the infinite and holy love of the Creator. This perfect atonement vindicates the righteousness of God's law and the graciousness of his character. For it both condemns our sin and provides for our forgiveness. The death of Christ is substitutionary and expiatory, reconciling and transforming. The bodily resurrection of Christ proclaims God's triumph over the forces of evil, and for those who accept the atonement, it assures their final victory over sin and death. It declares the lordship of Jesus Christ before whom every knee in heaven on earth will bow. Now that is our statement of faith, but what does it look like practically when we look at the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I can say that if you're looking at it, you can find many different descriptors of what this life of Jesus means. Many people will say, uh, Jesus healed people. He did great things for folks. He fed the poor. He healed the blind. He, he did nice things for people. So the gospel must mean doing nice things for people. Yes and no. Others will say that the gospel is a picture of a radical man who, a radical revolutionary person with new ideas who came to shake up the old traditions of the dusty old people in the church. We see Jesus having very radical ideas about spirituality, but is that the gospel? Probably not. When we look at the gospel, we could describe it probably as sacrifice and atonement. Two words, sacrifice and atonement. We see that there's a sacrifice made by one party in this story of the gospel. We see that atonement is made, and if you don't know what that word means, hold on a moment, we'll get there. We see that atonement is made between two parties in this gospel story. And as I searched the scripture to try to figure out what we could share from the scriptures, what what could be shared from the scriptures about the gospel, I came to Colossians chapter 1. Now Colossians chapter 1 
or the book of Colossians, is a very interesting book just based on the fact that the Colossian letter, this letter from Paul, was not only instructed to be read by the Colossian church or the church that was found in a city called Colossae, but it was also supposed to be shared with the Laodiceans. Now, if you're a good Adventist, you know what the Laodicean message is. It's a message to God's end time people. If you look at Revelation chapter 3, it's a message to God's end time people of being steadfast, of, of cleaning up our act so that we could be ready for Jesus' soon return. And it's interesting that Colossians is supposed to be read by the Laodiceans who were described as spiritually complacent people. People who were more in tune with the structures of religion instead of a relationship aspect of the gospel. And this was instructed for our reading. So Colossians is is to be a very dear book to God's end time people. And I hope you count yourself among God's end time people. So Paul is writing to the Colossians. He's trying to stir up in their minds this gospel message. And he, when he gets to verse 9 in this first chapter, he's talking about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He's, he's telling us why Jesus is so important. Why Jesus is, is the thing to be considered. And he's describing Jesus' place in the gospel. And he gets down to verse 19, 20, 19 through 23. And he begins to talk about the reconciliation in Christ. And there's a couple points that I want to point out from the gospel message in Colossians. Because I think it would do well for us to consider as Seventh-day Adventists, as we look at the gospel. I, I was in a school board meeting, and we were, um, I was supposed to give a devotional. And so when I was asked to give this devotional, I was thinking about, in the study of this, of this idea of the gospel message, how many times with all the beautiful truths that we have as Seventh-day Adventists, I mean, we, we have the investigative judgment, and we have the spirit of prophecy, and we have the Sabbath message, and how God's law is supposed to be preeminent in our lives, and we have all of this truth that seems to be forgotten by the rest of the Christian world, but sometimes we forget the essence of what it all means. Sometimes in the deep things we forget about the most important things, and that's the gospel message. And so Paul is bringing out this idea of reconciliation. And he begins in verse 19 and he says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Speaking about Jesus, he is just talking about how Jesus was so important in the gospel message. And then he says, And by him, this is Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him. Whether things, the himself being God, the by him being Jesus. So what he's saying here, so it doesn't get muddled here, is that it pleased the Father that through Jesus, everything would be reconciled back to the Father that we see in nature, that we see in this world, and that not only would it be reconciled by Jesus, Jesus being the matchmaker, but that it would be reconciled to God through what Jesus would do. And it says that all the things, and it gets a a, a little more specific, it says all the things that were to be reconciled were to be the things that are on earth, the things that are in heaven, having made peace through blood of the cross. And the first thing that I want to pull, you know, to, to, to help you consider, help us all consider is that reconciliation, the coming together of man and God after the sin issue has to do with peace through blood. Now, it seems like two contradictory ideas. Peace through blood. 
Now, we see that there's a problem here. For, for somebody to need, for, for two parties to be reconciled, what has happened for this to need to happen, for reconciliation to need to happen? There's been a rift between those two parties. And we see when we look at the Bible, we see from the very first book of the Bible, the beginning pages of Scripture, we see that there's a rift between God and human beings through sin. Now, sin is described in many ways in the Scripture, but sin is also described as something that separates God from man. It's an impurity. It's it's an evil. It's, It's a sickness that separates God from human beings. And so when we look at this idea of peace through blood, maybe in our culture it's difficult to understand how something that is impure is purified by putting blood on it. But in the biblical mind, blood is the life of an animal. And so what God is doing in this very picturesque, symbolic way, he's saying that your impurities, your sickness, and the death that sin brings from being separated from God is remedied not by Clorox, not by CLR, not by water even, but by blood. God is saying that your death is remedied by life, which is in the blood. Now we understand why throughout the Old Testament, the priests would take in this blood as as the sacrifice was made for the sins of those who had sinned. They come to the, the, the altar and they place their hands on this lamb, on this animal, and this animal, the sin is transferred from the human being to the animal symbolically, and then when the blood is shed, the blood is taken into the holy place. It's sprinkled on this curtain to show that where that blood hits, there's just a little bit more life that comes back to those who are dead. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when I look at my life, when I analyze the things that no one else knows, I thank God for the blood. Amen. I thank God for the blood because I know that I am dead in the trespasses of my sin. I know that without Christ, there's no hope for me except for a grave separated from God. But I know that because of the blood, there is peace. Because of the life that's in the blood, I am able to be reconciled to God again. And so we come to this idea of peace through blood. And you don't think of peace and death being something that goes together. Now, when we look at history, we see that there are situations where peace comes as a result of war. And war implies bloodshed and death and people who have died uh, on either side of that war. Pax Romana, for example, came through war. You know, the one way to get to peace is to stifle and stop everybody that's in your way. That's definitely one way to get through peace. But it's interesting that the gospel, and, and this is very, this is probably something, a nuance that would have been understood by the Colossian church living in the Pax Romana. But it's interesting that this story doesn't play out like the stories that we see in history. It doesn't play out like the stories of dominance that we see even today. It plays out a little bit different. Yes, there was peace through death, but the death was not your death. The death was Jesus' death. So imagine this peace that comes through death, through blood. But it's not your blood. Should it have been your blood? Should it have been my blood? Of course. But peace, the gospel peace between God and us comes at the expense of God through Jesus Christ and his blood. Peace through blood. Paul continues. Verse 
And he says, not only do we have peace through the blood that was shed on the cross, this sacrifice that Jesus initiates to win us back. By the way, I want to tell you that in no other religion in the world does this happen. This is unique to biblical Christianity. Unique to biblical Christianity and the fact that in every other religion there are sacrifices. There are rifts between the gods, the deities, and their worshipers. But the rift is what? It's remedied by the sacrifice of the people to appease the God. But Thank God that we serve a God of love. Thank God that we serve a God who loves us so much that the rift is resolved through the sacrifice of the deity on behalf of an undeserving people. Thank God for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul continues in verse 21, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. But how does he do it? He does it in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight. I want you to notice another dualism. It's not dualism necessarily in the religious standpoint but in the literary standpoint we reject God in our minds but God brings us back together in his body it's 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 hard to grasp We reject God in our minds. We rebel against God in our minds. We become enemies of God in our minds. But God does the salvation through his body. And sometimes we can miss the gospel message and we can think that somehow we can do something within our own selves, within our bodies, some action, whether it be a penance, whether we say our prayers every day or whether we read the Bible every day or whether we're kind with people every day and we do these actions and we want to repeat these actions, but it is impossible to to do actions to get the results that we're trying to get because the rebellion is in our minds. It's in our minds. And we can think every single, I mean, we are so rebellious. It's become so much part of our characters that we do it every day without even knowing. So I'm going to use uh, David Dickerson. I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but I'm going to use him as a... (laughs) I'm going to use him as a, as, so I, I, I knew that David had to leave town because of a family emergency. And so I, I called David and I, and I wanted to get in touch with David so that I can pray with him. And David didn't call me back. <laughs> and then I, I text David and here, here's the point of what I'm saying. I text David and I said, you know, a couple of days went by and I saw him drop off his kid. So I know he's back in town. And I text David and I said, David, Call me. No, I just said, call me. And David's response was, no. (laughs) And I know this is humorous. It's It's a humorous example of rebellion. Now, David, we did get in contact with each other, and David's my friend. That's why I'm using this, him as an example. And I know that this is a humorous example of what rebellion is, but we're so geared toward rebellion. It's so much part of our beings and our minds that God had to initiate the reconciliation, the bringing together of two warring parties. He had to initiate this through his bodily sacrifice so that our minds could be changed. And it is only through his sacrifice that our minds can be changed because we are geared towards enemy being enemies with God. We're geared towards rebellion with God. And one of the most beautiful things that we see in the gospel is not only does peace come through the sacrifice of the deity, but it is initiated wholly by our God who when we were enemies, 
when we were rebellious, when we didn't even want to be a part of his family, when we had no reason or desire for salvation, God comes down and he shows us through his acts, the acts of Jesus and the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, that the gospel is something worthy of paying attention to. It's something worthy to come close to. It's something worthy to be transformed by because it is our God who through his his love initiates our salvation. And this comes out in the real world, in the marketplace, in our lives every single day because we know that there's something wrong. We usually don't look within ourselves because that's part of the pride of sin. We don't ever think that we're the problem. Let me tell you from your pastor and the most loving, you know, I love Steve Boffman from the Academy. He, he begins every controversial uh, uh, meeting with, with discipline issues, he says, with love. Have you seen that, Peter? With love. So I tell you with love, folks, if you find yourself in a situation, if you find yourself in a rift with someone, if you find yourself in in an issue where harmony is broken, where peace is broken, please look within yourself first. Because the scripture says it comes here. It comes from here. But a lot of the times we look out at the rest of the world and we see that there's something wrong. We see that there's something wrong and there's no way of fixing this wrong in the lives that we live, whether it's our broken families, whether it's, if it's our children that don't want to serve God, whether if it's a problem at your job or school shootings that we've been seeing, multiple shootings and, and school violence acts this week. We see that something's wrong and what Paul is saying is that we need a transformation of our minds. We need to come in contact with God again. And the problems that we see in this world and the problems that we see with ourselves are due purely to the enemy status that we have in our minds against God. But the only way that that can be fixed is through a reconciliation that was provided for by the body and the sacrifice and the acts, pure acts of Jesus. And through that bodily sacrifice, Paul tells us in the, the, the last part of verse 21. That we begin to become transformed. You see, at the beginning of 21, we're alienated and we're enemies. We're wicked in our works. But God, through his sacrifice, Jesus, through his sacrifice, through the peace that comes from the life of the blood, we become holy, blameless, irreproachable in his sight. Now verse 23 continues and it says that there's an if, an if clause. I remember I got a good idea, which I, I've been asked by the school kids to repeat this good idea, but I got a good idea that I would bribe the kids to memorize scripture. And I told the class, the eighth grade class, that if they memorize a, a pretty hefty passage of scripture perfectly, because I'm paying for it, that I would give them 50 bucks. And there, was, there were three takers. Now, the clause in that is not to read the scripture. You get the 50 bucks. The catch, rather, not the clause, but the catch was not to, to, to memorize half of the scripture. The if you memorize it perfectly, you get the $50. And Paul puts this 
idea in the gospel message. That all of this is yours if. If. If indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. You see, it's not just a given. It's not just the gift is yours to take. But you actually have to take the gift. You have to be steadfast and grounded in the gospel. Steadfast means you're not moved away by ridiculousness. And so many of us are moved away from the gospel because our feelings are hurt, because somebody said something bad, because I don't like the way that things are done. I had one person leave church once, and this is a true story, I hate to say it, but I had one person leave the church once because the pastor went and preached from the pulpit. Selfishness. Because we're doing dishes on Sabbath after potluck. Where have we gone? The gospel becomes so trivialized by the way that we feel today. And Paul is saying that the only way that peace through blood comes, the only way that the transformation of our minds comes through the sacrifice of Jesus is that if we stay steadfast in the gospel. Too many Christians are babied and made felt like if any little bit of uncomfortableness happens, then we have to run with the committee that runs after people that are leaving. Paul says that's not how the gospel is preached. The gospel is preached, or the gospel is received through steadfastness, through being grounded. Steadfast means when things are trying to move you, you're bolted to the ground, you're there. So much in our society caters to our desires and our emotions and how we feel, but Paul is saying the gospel is not so, Laodiceans. The gospel is not so. The gospel is something that has to be so rooted in your heart that no matter what people say to you or do against you, you will not be moved. That's the gospel message. And it's only if, only if, Imagine the things that are coming upon the Christian church that are prophesied through Scripture. And we want to leave and give up just because somebody looked at us wrong. How are you to endure? How are you to endure? And I'm not saying that things should be left alone, that conflict shouldn't be resolved. I'm not saying that at all. But when somebody gives up and leaves the conversation because their feelings are hurt, that's not how the gospel is internalized in our hearts. It's something you've got to fight for. Because the devil is going to do everything he can to make sure that he has taken away your salvation. But there has to be some kind of awakening in the mind of God's people that helps us to understand that there is a controversy, there's a war going on in our heart, in our minds, over our own salvation, and that we're not going to make it unless we're steadfast and grounded in our faith and we're not moved away from the hope of the gospel. It's time to come out of our minds. It's time to come out of what what is holding us back because the gospel is more valuable. It's more important. It's our eternal life. 
And there should be nothing on this earth that would move us away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. There should be nothing in this church that moves you away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. There should be no relationship that you have on this earth that is either broken or it's intact that would pull you away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is our life, our peace through the blood of Jesus. It reconciles us to God through his actions and his body. But it's something that we have to fight the devil to keep every day. So the question that you should ask yourself, and I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, because I don't, it's hard for me to do it. And these sermons are so much for myself as they are for everybody that is sitting here. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is it worth me losing the gospel? Is this and you may, be, you may be justified in every bit of your grievance. It may be totally everyone else's fault. And you may really be the victim. But Paul tells us to continue in the faith. To be steadfast, unmovable. In our hope. So ask yourself the question. Is this worth it? Is it worth it? I'll be willing to bet that it's not nine times out of ten. So then you have to tell yourself. This will not move me. This will not shake my hope. You know, and, and, and Jennifer will know what I'm talking about. We had a conversation not too many, about a month ago or so downstairs. And I shared with Jennifer some things that have happened to me in my walk as an Adventist, by Adventists. But you know, God has a way when you stick to it. And I don't know who I'm talking to. But God has a way of putting you right back in the place where you were wronged and vindicating you. But the moment that you walk out of the church, the moment that you leave, the moment that you give up, and you've told everybody all of the good excuses that you have, You've taken the matter out of God's hands and you're working on it on your own. And if I'm reading this right, it says that all of our works are wicked. Be steadfast. Be grounded. Continue in the faith. and in the hope of the gospel which you heard.